so much. It's great to be here. Um, I, I'm a Rochester native, so I love being in what is truly upstate New York, not the parts of New York State that people say they're in upstate New York, but they're not really. So it's great to be here. It's great to be in this fascinating hotel. Um, I do a lot of uh, events and speak in a lot of very generic hotels. So it's very nice to be someplace interesting. Now, I need to start with a warning. I do not know who groups call when they want somebody to give a speech that says, everything is great, just be happy. But they don't call me for those speeches. They tend to call me to give a speech about lots of challenges. And that is my view of the situation in higher education generally, and particularly for those in enrollment management broadly defined. These are very tough times. And so I'm gonna talk about why they are tough times. Now, I wanna tell you just to, to pace yourselves, at the end of my uh, perhaps too doom and gloom outlook, I'm gonna give you free stuff. I brought a lot of swag. Um, so, so that'll be a reward for sitting through and you can come up and get swag. Now, um, before I start, I wanted to say just one thing about the President of the United States. Um, I find these days that when I speak to academic groups, there is a tendency, I fear too much of a tendency, to blame everything on the President of the United States. It's raining today in Buffalo, Trump did it. <laughs> and I think it's important from, for some perspective. Many of the things I'm going to talk about today do, in fact, relate to the current political moment and to the current occupant of the White House. So I don't want to say he's not a factor. He is very much a factor. But I also hope, as you listen to me talk about issues, that you reflect on the reality that many of these issues predated the Trump administration and some of them may well outlast the Trump administration. So I fear that too much emphasis on the White House may discourage the kind of thinking that you need to do to be creative about your campus challenges. Um, so the way I'm gonna organize this is I'm gonna talk first about three overarching issues that affect pretty much all parts of higher education. Then I'm gonna talk about eight specific to enrollment management issues that I think relate to those broader issues. Um, and so to try to give you just a, a, a roadmap for where we're going. So the first overarching issue is that the economic model for higher education isn't working and it's not working in public higher education or private higher education, with the possible exception of the elites in both sides. Now, many of you are probably at institutions, how many, show of hands, how many of you are at institutions with billion dollar endowments? None, none. Uh, or maybe, maybe there's one who's embarrassed to hold up her hand because she thinks you'll ask her for drinks tonight, but, but you thus are the norm in American higher education. You're not rich. And so, you know, that's a good thing. You don't have to worry about managing those billion dollar endowments, but it means you don't have a lot of money. Now, and many institutions of higher education have been doing great work without a lot of money throughout their history. But I would argue that we are in difficult times right now that stand out. In the last six months, Mount Ida College closed. Atlantic Union College closed. Concordia, Alabama closed. St. Gregory's closed. St. Joseph's of Indiana put itself on indefinite suspension. We have also seen a series of mergers in higher education with colleges to survive uh, linking up with a wealthier institution. Now, I do not believe, as Clay Christensen does, that hundreds and hundreds of colleges are about to go under, but I think some are. I think if you look at the colleges that have closed or merged, they are institutions that had been getting by. 
and it is no longer the case that they can assume just because they've been getting by that they will continue to get by. Now, so now you're thinking all those institutions I just gave, they had minuscule endowments, small enrollments, no, you know, they, they had the odds against them. But I would argue that it's tough even for colleges with more name recognition and money. We wrote last week about Earlham College in Indiana. Uh, outstanding reputation as a liberal arts college, an endowment approaching half a billion dollars. Earlham is in deep trouble these days. Earlham in 2017 took in $14.1 mil, $14 million in tuition revenue. In 2008, a decade earlier, Earlham took in $21.3 million in tuition revenue. Think about that for a second. Losing a third of your tuition revenue in a decade. And because of their endowment, they've been able to survive, but they are now looking at deep cuts, trying to basically bring their budget back to where it was a decade ago. And this is a good college, a high quality college with good students. Um, the traditional models just aren't working. Um, on the public side as well, things are very tight. Not maybe for the University of Michigan, but for everyone else. Um, the budget cuts that started in 2008 have never really been restored, even as in many states enrollment demands have increased. And if you look at the regional publics and the community colleges, they are doing more with much less. Now, in public higher education, it's actually very hard to kill a public college. They survive. But it's not that hard to budget a public college into mediocrity. And we are seeing deep cuts that really go against the mission of many institutions in public higher ed. So that's one overarching issue. The second overarching issue is a lack of consensus on what the purpose of higher education is. You are in higher education, so you probably think you know what the mission is. But I'd say right now, there is less certainty in society about that. Let me give you an example. Governor Jerry Brown of California, who's actually been very good to public higher education, gave a speech recently in which he said, cited a business that he said should be a role model for higher education. Any guesses from those who didn't hear the speech on what business he suggested? Healthcare. Healthcare. He actually suggested a specific business, not just an industry. Google. Google. Mongoose. <laughs> no, he suggested that public higher education should be more like Chipotle. <laughs> now, think about that for a minute. And this is, again, from a governor who's devoted a lot of resources to higher education. And he said the reason Chipotle was a good model is that when he goes to Chipotle, he goes through the line and they ask him a few questions. Burrito or bowl? Red beans or black beans? Chicken or veggies? Want a guac for an extra dollar? <laughs> and then you're done. And he argued that's what public higher education should be like. Fewer choices, more efficiency. Now, when we wrote about this, our readers at the University of California, where the faculty have won 62 Nobel Prizes, were not amused. Nor were those at Cal State, where they educate 450,000 students, many of them first-generation minority students, every year. And it's easy to pick apart this idea. After all, last time I went to Chipotle, no one asked me what I thought about the nutritional value or how my burrito was fitting in with my life goals. <laughs> so I would argue that actually it's a very different experience. But it is interesting that a pro higher ed governor said that. And I think there are real questions about what is the mission of higher ed. Is it to get students in and out quickly and efficiently, as the Chipotle model would suggest? 
or is it about something more? Is higher ed just about helping students get a marketable skill for a first job or preparing them for life? Is it about doing the most with the least money or something else? And I think right now there is no consensus and that makes it very hard. And then throw in the issue of our increasingly diverse society. Is it a role of higher ed to educate everybody, to provide opportunities for everybody, to worry about the fact that we aren't an equal society or not? For the first time in generations, people are making the or not argument, even if that runs counter to the values of many in higher ed. And then my third overarching issue is that I see higher education increasingly divided between have and have not institutions. Um, there are very wealthy institutions that actually can ignore most of the messages of my talk today because they're doing just fine. And then there are a lot of institutions that to do their good work have to struggle, innovate, come up with new ideas and do so when the big guys down the street can outspend them 10 to 1. We are, whether you're talking about the public sector with flagships, the privates with their IVs, um, it's a very Darwinian world right now in higher education. And I think that affects everyone. And there are also a lot of institutions that are wealthy compared to most, but poor compared to their competitors. So it is rare that I meet a president who's like feeling good about their finances. And I think that underlies a lot of these issues. So with those big issues, I now want to talk about specific to enrollment management eight. And none of them are, are easy. These are tough things. Issue number one, more and more pressure to fill the class every year. Um, show of hands, how many of you met your goal for your, your, how many of your institutions met your goal for new students for next year by May 1st? Okay, these are the lucky ones. They're also increasingly the minority. When we have written about the percentage who fill their class by May 1st, increasingly I get emails from people saying, you need to write a story, which I did this year, that actually June 1st is the new May 1st, or August 1st is the new May 1st, and there's some who believe October 1st is the new May 1st. <laughs> um, May 1st is no longer something to take for granted, and that creates all kinds of issues. And if you think that's bad now, it's about to get much worse. Uh, I would recommend that you read a book by Nathan Graw called Demographics and Demand in Higher Education. He is a Carleton College economist. And what he did, many of you have seen the studies by Witchy and others that note the decline in the traditional age college student population. What he did is he looked at data from 2008. When the economy tanked, people started having far fewer children. And um, those fewer children in 2008, well, they're the ones in the not so distant future you want to enroll. And he's projecting that most non-elite colleges, public and private, will see declines in their traditional enrollment pool of 25% or more by the early 2020s. Think about that for a second. You are struggling to hit May 1st and it could be about to get much tighter. Even more so in parts of the country like this, which however great they are, are not booming in population. Um, and the reason this worries me is that I see so many colleges that tell me the exact same strategy for how they're gonna attract students. They're gonna add a lacrosse team. They're gonna recruit more full pay international students. They're gonna add a major in cybersecurity. All of these are perfectly reasonable things to do. If you all do them, they will not work for all of you, period. And I see a lot of cookie cutter solutions. I think the key here is gonna be niche. Uh, I mentioned as I was talking to some of you at breakfast that a few years ago, I happened to give back-to-back -back convocation speeches 
at Swanee and Southern New Hampshire State University. Couldn't imagine two more different institutions. Swanee is on a hilltop in the middle of nowhere in Tennessee. Looks like it's out of like Harry Potter. And um, it enrolls only polite students. They ask you, they, they see a stranger, they say, good morning, sir. Uh, for me, this was very shocking before I had coffee. Um, <laughs> SNHU, mostly online, competency, you name it. If it's a new idea, they're doing it. Most of the students are not at their campus in New Hampshire. Couldn't imagine two more different institutions. I think both of them are going to be fine. Both of them are going to do well because they know what they are. And I think that is going to be far more important than doing the latest trend. Issue two, international students. For many institutions, a key part of the enrollment strategy in recent years has been boosting international students. And let's be honest here, it's let's boost full pay international students. We all know there are brilliant students in Bangladesh, not just in India, but your institutions are all going to India, and there's a reason. Um, our numbers are down. 7% decline this year in new international enrollments. 20% decline in intensive English language enrollments. Those are the programs that prepare students who couldn't do well enough on the TOEFL to enroll already. So that population is going down. The perception out there, and it's unfair because most of your campuses are extremely welcoming, is that our country has gone off the deep end. And it's a real perception, forget whether it's real. I gave a speech a few months ago at the University of Toronto, and there was a reception after, and this very nice professor came up to me, wanted to chat, and her question to me was, I need to ask you something as an American, how frequently do you fire your gun? That was her first question to me. <laughs> now, my speech did not touch on guns at all. I have never owned or fired a gun. And that was her assumption, because I'm an American. Um, the press we are getting, not to criticize the media for spreading fake news, but <laughs> The, uh, the rest of the world reads what we read and assumes we're all gun nuts who hate anybody who's not white. And let's face it, there are some Americans for whom that is true. Those of you who work on college campuses may think that you're in something of a bubble, and that's great, but the perception of our country has changed. And that is going to continue to be a challenge. They're creative things that people are doing, but it's a challenge. Then there's the uncertain global environment. One of our stories today is about what happened yesterday. The Saudi government announced that it is pulling seven, all of its 7,000 scholarship students out of Canada because of a fight between Saudi Arabia and Canada that has nothing to do with higher ed. Now, I'm, I'm guessing that there's some Sunni Buffalo people on the Rainbow Bridge right now, like saying, please come with me to, uh, to, to, to Buffalo. And so you might think, hey, this is a good thing for American higher ed. And at a simplistic level, it probably is. I bet many of those students will land at some of your institutions. But what if it had been the US that got in a fight with Saudi Arabia? What if our current fights with China led to such a thing. Now, and, and it doesn't have to be, Saudi Arabia is pulling out everybody, so these are full pay students. But what if China cut by like 1% the number of exit visas they gave to students? Many American colleges and universities would suffer seriously. And that is a real threat. And again, I go back to my have, have not. If you look at the numbers this year, MIT, Berkeley, untouched by what's going on. It's not that their international students don't hate President Trump too, but they will hold their noses and get an MIT degree. But for other institutions, they're going to look at Canada. And despite what's going on with, um, with Saudi Arabia, Canada is doing great. Now, it's not, and just to give you some numbers, 
Um, Middle Eastern students up 86% at University of Toronto, which is one of their better universities, not far from here. Turkey up 70%. Guess which country is up 100% among undergrads at the University of Toronto this year? The United States of America. So think about that for a second. If you don't know the U of Toronto, it's a very good university. It is not easy to get into. Every one of those students would have been a star student at any one of your institutions. And they're going to Canada. Now why? It's not just politics. Um, it's also cost. The cost for an American to go to a Canadian university as a non-Canadian is about three quarters of the cost of typical out-of-state tuition at a US public. So it costs less, but Canada is investing more, and they're very comfortable with diversity. It's a very different environment, and they're cleaning up. And, it, and again, it's the world as a whole. Look at Brexit, which is messing up British students or European students studying in the UK. Um, higher ed, globally, has embraced the idea that higher ed should be global and that students should flow, faculty should flow, and so forth. That idea is being challenged and it upsets both your economic models, but it also affects your ability to balance your budgets. Issue three, return on investment debate. Here's an issue that I think higher ed has botched completely. If you remember back in the 2004 Republican presidential nomination campaign, Rick Santorum started to give speeches about how not everyone needs a college degree. Now, actually, President Obama, who he was attacking, never said that. But Santorum said this, and everyone in higher ed sort of chuckled. But guess what? Santorum won the battle of ideas. These days, there are columns on a weekly basis saying people, more people are going to college than should. The media loves to do stories, favorite story topic, the college graduate who is working as a barista and living in his parents' basement. Sort of every parent's horror story. You see that over and over again. Now here's why this drives me crazy. It's false. Every social science study shows that having an associate degree is better than not having one, having a bachelor's degree better than associate degree, master's better than bachelor's, on and on. There is no debate. Now, during the Great Recession, it is true that the launch period took longer and the payoffs were smaller, but even in this period, better to have a degree than not. And yet, that's discussed as if that's an unknown question. It's even true at liberal arts. Uh, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences recently released a study looking at the long-term career paths and uh, economic conditions of people by major. Humanities graduates are as employed as others, are as likely to be managers as others, are more likely than some other groups to say that they have enough money to meet their needs and wants, and here's the really, really big one, they're happy. Now, to read a lot of the rhetoric, you would think that's impossible, and yet there are data, and there are other studies showing this. Somehow, though, higher ed has lost this message. And I think it's hurting institutions to have to start their discussions not with, um, this is why my college is a cool college, but to start with, it's worth it to go to college. You really shouldn't have to be making that case, but today you do, I think, because higher ed dropped the ball. Issue four, federal threats to affirmative action. Um, every few years there's a Supreme Court case in recent years, the pro-affirmative action side has won, although there are limits on what you can do. Um, and then a new case comes up. Um, right now, the Trump administration has withdrawn guidance issued by the Obama administration on how to legally do affirmative action. Um, 
We have Justice Kennedy leaving the Supreme Court. Justice Kennedy was the key fifth vote in favor of affirmative action. We have a case at Harvard where uh, Asian groups are saying that Harvard's affirmative action policies discriminate against them. I don't know what will happen with these cases, but this issue of the legality of affirmative action is alive and well. Now, there's much discussion, you know, should you care? Should you worry about this? It is true that there are probably only about 50 colleges and universities where they consider race in admissions. But many, many more colleges consider race in financial aid, special summer program. Do you have a summer program for women in science? Do you have a special summer program for minority students? Any number of things. This is going to affect you and your institutions. Um, and the other key thing to remember, particularly for those of you whose duties extend beyond admissions, when our courts and our political systems debate affirmative action, race relations seem to go down on campus. It raises issues where people say to minority students, why are you here, which is grossly unfair. Um, but just it seems to bring out the worst in our society and I'm not sure we're doing so well, period. Then there's the question, issue five, more scrutiny of colleges' policies on equity and diversity. I had a big story yesterday about why it is considered legal for elite universities to favor alumni children, even if most of those children are white and wealthy, and not all of them are super bright, while we are debating the legality of helping out applicants of color. Um, are there are a lot of more people asking questions about why is that the case? Why do colleges favor those groups? Um, other college policies like early decision. Many would make a good case that early decision favors the wealthier, generally the whiter applicant. Um, preferring full pay students. Well, I know most colleges when they say they want full pay students, they would be thrilled to get full pay African Americans, and it's not like they're excluding the full pay African Americans, but when they say full pay, who are you talking about? Let's be honest, and I think there is gonna be more scrutiny of these policies, particularly if colleges are saying, please let us decide what we should do on race and ethnicity. Issue six, state policies on free tuition. So I have to, uh, being back in New York State, Note that issue. How many of you here are from New York State colleges? New York State privates. Okay, so you all know about Excelsior. Um, uh, Andrew Cuomo isn't thrilled with us this week because we just wrote about um, how a lot of financial aid people are having trouble administering Excelsior. But um, many private colleges are deeply distressed by Excelsior and nationally by the idea, which is being looked at elsewhere, of free public tuition and asking why. Why is it that um, states are doing this? I think it is a reality that many states have decided as they look at uh, affordability issues, they're largely focusing on the public sector, not the private sector. And the challenge, particularly in a state like New York, but many others, is that many New York colleges primarily enroll New York residents. So changing the incentives is a big deal. Um, we have seen some private colleges very successfully maintain their enrollments, but I suspect this issue will spread. Now the other thing, even if you are a public in New York State to watch, is it's great, free tuition sounds great, but it's only really great if someone's paying the bills. And there are real questions about whether the, off, the lost tuition revenue is coming through. Issue seven, transfer. Transfer is becoming more and more important. One of the more bizarre stories we wrote this year was noting that Princeton University admitted transfer students for the first time since 1990. Now, I don't think Princeton deserves a medal for that. To me, the question is, why weren't they? 
And the reality is Princeton is not alone. All of a sudden, more institutions are discovering transfer. Part of this is that particularly at privates with higher sticker prices, many low-income families are just saying flat out, I will not consider this institution. Two years at a community college, maybe they would. Two years at a free community college, maybe they would. I'm actually surprised more private colleges haven't embraced the free community college movement as a way to attract more transfer students. So we're seeing more do that. At the same time, I'm not sure many colleges have really thought through what they need to do to be welcoming to transfer students. I don't mean just let them in. I mean let them in and evaluate their credits fairly. I also mean looking at the student experience. I was talking to the president of a community college in Florida where, who provides a lot of his students to nearby public four years. I said, what would you like from them? He said, I'd like them to stop pretending that my students are in the minority. He said, I send them half their class, and yet all of student affairs is built around Greek life and athletics, and not one of my students cares at all. Think about that. If you really want transfer students, what do they want? Clue, the, the top issue is transfer credits. Then they also want better career counseling for people like them. Career counseling for a 28-year-old single parent who's been out in the workforce before going to community college and then back looks very different than that for a 22-year-old who came straight from high school. So it's not just saying we want these students, but are you prepared for them? And finally, the issue of loans. Loans and concern about loans, that is why you see the free tuition debate and most of your institutions are losing students for fear of borrowing. Now, I graduated from college with $10,000 in debt, best investment of my life. I don't think all debt is bad, but people are reading all the horror stories and abandoning debt. The people do not understand, students and their parents have no clue about what a private loan is versus a federally backed loan. And generally, I would discourage most people from taking out private loans, not federally backed loans. But this is another area where colleges have lost the narrative, and as a result of losing the narrative, you're losing applicants. It doesn't matter how generous you are in financial aid if nobody applies, because they don't know. You gotta think seriously about the loan issue, talk about it, educate it, educate people. It's important as well to remember, you may think, I've had all these people say to me, but we have such a great program, blah, 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 blah. Um, most Americans, and I'm not talking about high school seniors, most American adults are pretty clueless about finances. They don't understand credit card debt. They don't, you know, look, look at the data on our country, and yet people expect 18-year-olds to make a sophisticated analysis of whether taking out a loan is worth it. You're losing that, and as a result, you're losing students. Now, before I turn to your questions and then giving you all swag, um, I want to close by saying I, I realize I've given you a, a long list of real problems. I do it for a few reasons. And one, there, it's important to remember, there's a lot of creativity out there, a lot of colleges doing good things on these and other issues. But I give you this list because I also fear a lot of complacency. There are a lot of colleges out there where people feel, oh, well, if we just, you know, get rid of our enrollment management VP and bring in a superstar, that will solve everything. If we let our discount rate grow a little, that will solve everything. If we just recruit more Chinese students, that will solve everything. Um, and so I think it's really important to step back and say, what are the long-term trends like? What are the challenges like? If I had to offer the true challenge, if you think about the issues I've discussed, some of them are real financial challenges. Some of them, in my opinion, are ethical and moral challenges. Now, the great thing for me being a journalist is I don't have to balance your budgets. 
I don't have to fight with your presidents. I can just say, you should do the right thing and also balance your budget, and you'll figure out how. And I realize that is hard for many of your institutions. I also know many people in enrollment management want to do one thing but are being told by their bosses they have to do the other. So I realize it's not easy. But balancing that moral equation of keeping your institution afloat, bringing good students, but doing the right thing is the real challenge. And I say that because your institutions change lives. Your institutions, by educating students, make the world a better place. So I want you to get it right. Thank you.